This is your step-by-step -step full guide on how to make your first $1 million online. This no fluff guide is based on my own experience building and selling my last company for $110 million, but also the last 16 years that I've been building and running companies. And I have spent ages condensing all that knowledge into this video. There's no sales pitch or anything in this video. Everything is free. So please relax, watch the full thing. It could really change your life. I'm gonna answer your biggest questions like, what business should you start? I'll give you the three rules you must absolutely follow as a beginner entrepreneur. Or how do you find a mentor? I'll give you my exact step-by-step -step framework. I'm also gonna teach you the five skills you absolutely need to make your first million in today's economy, plus the critical mindset shift that you must make if you wanna be successful. See, Steph Curry actually gave me some of the best business advice that I ever got, and it was around resilience. You know, I was at this private swanky event where Silicon Valley bigwigs all, you know, invite their new portfolio companies. Someone asked Steph Curry, how do you deal with the ups and downs of winning games and losing games and going back and forth, like especially in the championship rounds? And Steph said, you know, no one goes the entire season without losing a game. It just doesn't happen. You're gonna win some games, you're gonna lose some games. When you lose games, it's not a sign that you are off the beat off the path that you're doing something wrong. It's just a sign of the journey that you're on. You're gonna go up and you're gonna go down. That's part of the journey of being a championship team. The same thing applies to you. As you're going out on your entrepreneurship journey, as you're setting out to make your first million, it's not gonna be smooth sailing. You're gonna go up and you're gonna go down. What I want you to do in those moments is remind yourself, hey, this is the journey that I signed up on. These low moments that you're experiencing are not signs that something is going wrong it's signs that you're on the right path. There is no one in history that has become successful without going through these ups and down journeys. But what happens is if you haven't experienced that, you feel good when you're on the high moments, but when you go to the low moments, you start to think this is not working, something's not right. And in reality, it's just a sign of the journey. So build in the power of resilience, understand these ups and downs are part of the journey, but there's still one more mindset shift and that is the mindset of sacrifice. Everybody now talks about work-life balance and follow your passions and blah, 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 blah. Those people actually probably aren't successful or they've become so successful that they forget what it was like in the early days. When you are starting out, you need to be willing to grind. You need to be willing to sacrifice certain things in your life so that you can have things in the future. You know, when I was starting my first business, I was just entering college. And you know, college is this time of parties and fun and girls, and not for me. I was in my dorm room working my butt off basically all the time. I failed a couple of classes my freshman year because I was even sacrificing my grades, which maybe don't do, but I was like, listen, I know exactly what I wanna do. I wanna build wealth through a business and all this other stuff it's just not important to me. I don't need to be going to the parties. I can do that later. And so if you're gonna embark down this journey, you need to be willing to say, what is actually important right now? Is it building your business or is it going out with your friends? Is it building your business or is it binging Netflix? There are times when you can take a break, but generally in the early years, you should be sacrificing most of the instant gratifications that life wants to tempt you with in order to delay gratification for a much larger reward. Now, with that mindset shift, you need to actually start taking action. And this is where the education versus experience paradigm comes into play. You see, when you're a beginner entrepreneur, it feels like you don't know anything. And all you wanna do is just learn, learn, learn. What you're actually trying to do is fill that sense of fear, that fear of failure by learning. And listen, as a beginner, you need to learn. You have so much that you need to learn, but you can only learn so much. What you really need is experience, not education. It's like that saying, you can't learn to ride a bike at a seminar. You can read all the books, you can understand how gravity works and how momentum works and things like that. But until you get on that bike, you do not actually know how to ride the bike. It's the only way you're gonna learn. The same thing applies to business. If you want to be successful, if you want to become a successful entrepreneur, you have to get into the field. You have to start playing. And so I really wanna caution you, do not spend too much time in the education phase where you're just teaching yourself and not actually taking action. And in fact, to make that super simple, here are the only five skills that you need to learn if you wanna make your first million dollars online. Something I took from Alex Ramosi that I love is not knowing how to make a billion dollars a year costs you a billion dollars every year. Well, the same thing applies here. Not knowing how to make your first million is literally costing you a million dollars 
every year. And you have to understand the only reason you don't have a million dollars is simply because you don't know how to earn it. It's not a lack of time. It's not because of your childhood or your parents. It's not because you're too busy. It's simply because you lack the knowledge on how to make that million dollars. So here are the five skills to make your first million dollars. First is sales and persuasion. Everything in life at some level is sales, whether you're selling your product to a potential customer, whether you're selling an employee on joining your company, or even in an argument with your spouse. It might not feel like sales, but it is. It's sales and persuasion, or in that case, maybe more feels like a hostage situation. This is a skill that you need to master if you want to get the most out of life. And there's an amazing book that I recommend. It's called Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Chris Voss was the lead hostage negotiator for the FBI for many years, and he shares deep fundamental principles of negotiating and persuading humans in this incredible story format where he's walking through his own experience negotiating with terrorists and kidnappers. The second skill you need to learn is digital marketing. And specifically, I would actually learn the skill of copywriting. Copywriting is a skill basically as old as time. Since we started writing things, we were writing things to persuade people, to convince them to do things, to take action. Copywriting really took off in the 1900s when people were making these massive billboard ads and this is you know the era of Mad Men and things like that. They had to figure out how can we write five, 10, 20 words that can produce hundreds of millions of dollars of sales. And this is where copywriting became an art form. So given that we're making money online, we need to learn the art of taking those sales and persuasion skills that we learned and putting them pen to paper. And to do that, the best book that I found is Copywriting Secrets by Jim Edwards. It's actually a pretty recent book, but it's a very practical how-to guide on how to learn copywriting and how to actually use it to make money. The next skill you wanna learn is cold outbound outreach. Cold outbound outreach simply means that you are trying to reach prospects that you wanna sell things to, that you want to either sell your product or get to sign up for a beta, whatever. What cold outbound outreach does is it puts the ball in your court. You're not waiting for customers to come to your website and sign up. You're not waiting for business to come your way. You can actually build a system where you have a given number of outputs, maybe a number of calls, a number of emails, and you know that based on that number of calls and emails, you will get a certain number of customers. So if you look at the board and you say, okay, we need $10,000 in sales, you can actually backwards track that and say, well, this is how many calls and emails we need to do to get that $10,000 of sales. And it very quickly allows you to grow and scale a business even from the early days. You don't need a big marketing presence. You don't need PR or a YouTube channel or anything. You can actually just go out, find customers for your business and sell them immediately. The book I would recommend that you check out is called The Sales Development Playbook by Trish Bertuzzi. It's what we used actually at my company when we were scaling from zero to $110 million. It's a super awesome book. Go check it out. The fourth skill you wanna learn is product thinking. Now product thinking is a bit of an ambiguous term. What it basically means is you need to learn the art of actually understanding what someone wants in a product, in a service, in a business, and how to build a product that matches their desires. You see, most people think the journey of the entrepreneur is this sort of Steve Jobs-esque thing where you sit on a whiteboard, imagine these amazing futures and this visionary product, and then you go to market, you announce it on stage, and everyone goes wild. That works if you're Steve Jobs, but I'm not Steve Jobs. You're probably not Steve Jobs too. Rather than trying to be this creative visionary that is such a, such a high bar, all you need to do is learn to talk to people get them to tell you what they want and then go build it and they'll buy it from you. It sounds simple because it is. So the book that I'd recommend for this is called The Lean Startup by Eric Rice. It is an amazing book. It's one of the first books that I read when I was starting my startup. It will teach you how to actually interview people, understand what they really want to buy, test that you understand it properly, and then ultimately sell them that product. And the last of the five skills that you need to learn if you wanna make your first million online in today's economy is basic programming. Listen, computers are eating the world and you don't need to be a computer scientist, you don't need to learn how to actually program, but you do need to understand how computers work. How does code actually work? How does it produce the results that we see on screens, on phones, et cetera? If you don't understand this, you simply are not able to compete in today's digital economy. So to build this basic understanding where you're not actually programming anything, but you can speak to programmers, you can understand the way programmers think and help direct them to build products for you and ultimately build a business, the level of skill that you want to get to is called pseudocoding. Pseudocoding is basically you can whiteboard out an idea for a product and how the computer might build that product or how it might deliver that product, but you're not actually writing the actual code. Writing code is kind of like very grammar specific. If you have a comma in the wrong place or a 
semicolon when you meant a colon, the whole thing breaks. You don't need to learn that. You just need to learn this pseudocoding skill. Now, the best way to do that because programming is so dynamic and constantly changing is actually just to go on YouTube. The thing that I would specifically search for is one, a basic overview of programming, just to understand how programming works. And then I'd wanna learn how to write what's called a hello world program in a few languages, probably HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You can kind of figure out how to build some hello world style projects in those three. It's not gonna change your life. You're not gonna become this amazing programmer, but you will understand enough about programming to actually build amazing products with developers. And this is something you should learn even if you're not trying to ship a software business, because ultimately, if you're making a million dollars in today's economy, you're doing it in a digital age. It's just the way it's played. So learn basic programming. Now, one of the skills I did not mention here that I just wanna to touch on is the skill of investing. See, everybody starting out wants to learn, how do I invest $10? How do I invest my first $1,000 and turn it into a million dollars? Listen, turning $1,000 into a million dollars is essentially playing the lottery. You're probably almost better off just literally buying lottery tickets than trying to invest your $1,000 to turn it into a million dollars. It's just a pipe dream, something that people would be happy to sell you courses on, but it's not actually grounded in reality. The investment that you should be thinking about right now is how do I invest any money that I'm making into these skills that I just went over, the five skills to make a million dollars. If you take your money that you earn and invest it in those, then you can actually develop the skill set to make a million dollars quite easily and quite predictably. Don't worry about investing in stock markets. Don't worry about investing in bonds. I would just really set that stuff aside. It will be there for you when you make your millions of dollars. Right now, you need to be investing in yourself. Now, with these skills in your tool belt, it's time to make two critical decisions. The first is what is your superpower going to be? You see, no one becomes successful by being a jack of all trades. You cannot learn all of these skills equally. You know, if you look at all the great entrepreneurs, Jeff Bezos, was he programming Amazon? No, he was building the business side of it. Look at Steve Jobs. He wasn't programming the early apples. He was designing the products and coming up with the ideas. If you wanna be successful, you need to build this sort of foundational level of the five skills that I talked about, and then you need to go deep on one or two. And this is where you need to actually look inwards and say, what do I love doing? What do I gravitate towards? And to make that decision easy for you, I would say there's basically two choices that you have. On one hand, you can go the technical route. The technical route says, you know what? I'm gonna go super deep on programming and architecture and developing software or websites or you name it. And these technical skills are going to be my superpower. And it could be design as well, just something that is more technically grounded. You are gonna go deep on this and then when you build things, you're probably gonna end up partnering with people or hiring people that are good at sales, marketing, customer acquisition. On the other hand, let's say you you look at programming, you say, listen, I did the YouTube tutorials, but it still all looks like gibberish to me. I don't love the idea of being a programmer. I don't see myself, you know, headphones strapped in, programming in the dark eight hours a day. I'm gonna go the more customer facing route. The customer facing route is really the business route. That means you're gonna learn more sales, more persuasion, more in the copywriting and digital marketing. Either way, you need to actually pick one and sort of make it your superpower. Being above average in everything actually just produces sort of average results. You need to be world-class in a few things and just maybe average to below average in those other ones. So make this choice, are you gonna go the technical route or the business route? Now the second critical choice is called the king versus rich choice. And this choice will actually impact all of your future decisions. What type of business you run, how do you hire people, how do you operate the business, do you take on investment money? Everything boils down to the king versus rich. So on the king path, you get flexibility. You get to work when you want. You get to work with who you want. You get to take a week off just because you feel like it. You are sort of running things, not like a dictatorship, but maybe like a king. You decide when and how you work. You have full control of your schedule. Your team members are probably more contractors or distant employees versus building something that's really, you know, a large cohesive team in-house. Contrast that with the rich path. The rich path is probably a more likely way to build wealth, but it means that you are going to give up some personal autonomy. You're gonna make some sacrifices to yourself and your self-being so that you can become rich. And what this generally means is you're gonna build a team that relies on you the way that you rely on them. So just like you're managing your team, well, they have expectations of you. So you can't just take a month off. You have to actually support and work with your team. You'll probably take on investment. Even if it's a small investor, it's not your money when they invest. And so the investors have some say in how you run your business. They have some say in how you spend your time. The benefits of the rich choice is that you just are building a larger business. You're putting more hours in, you're putting more effort in, 
you're bringing on outside investors, you're giving up some control, but the overall pie is much bigger. So hey, maybe you don't own 100% of the business, but the business gets to be much larger. So when you do sell it, you still make a lot more money. There's no right or wrong answer here, but for me personally, I went the king route for my first two businesses. They didn't get me to the riches I wanted. So then I said, okay, I'm gonna go all in on the rich route. I'm gonna build a big team. I'm gonna get investors. I'm gonna raise tons of money and try to build this massive business. And that's what I did. I ultimately sold that business for $110 million. Now that I've made my money, I will say I'm back in the king camp. I don't wanna have a calendar filled with Zoom calls. You know, at one point I had almost 200 employees rolling into me. And that means that there's 200 things that could be going on at any given day. I don't want that anymore. I just want a simple, chill life, make YouTube videos like this and have fun. There's no right or wrong way here, but it's something that you need to decide relatively early on because it will dictate kind of how you build this thing. Now, let's talk about the journey, how you actually build your first business. You see, everyone wants to know, how do I choose a business idea? How do I choose the right business model? Choosing a business model is one of the most critical decisions you will make. It will dictate so much of your success in the future. There are basically three fundamental business models. So I'm gonna go over each one and break down how easy it is to get started, how much risk you personally need to take on to get going, how hard it is to actually run once it's up and operational. And finally, what is the likelihood that it will actually get you to your million dollar goal? Spoiler alert, I think there's one clear winner, but I'll let you be the judge. So the first is selling physical products. This is e-commerce, this is drop shipping, this is where you're actually delivering something to a customer. As for how hard it is to get going on this, I would give it a three out of five. The reason being is you need to set up an online store, that's the easy part, but you also need to find a product to sell. This is either drop shipping or more than likely, finding, developing, and building a product, getting a manufacturer over in China to actually warehouse the product, sell it, ship it to you, and then you ship that out to the customer. It's a lot of heavy lifting to actually go through the process of building a hardware product. On top of that, I would give it a three out of five for the risk because you're actually investing a good bit upfront. Even if you wanna to try to de-risk it as much as possible and do a Kickstarter launch where you get people to pre-buy your product before you invest too much money, you can't just show them renders of a product. You probably need to actually build a few prototypes. So building a physical product just has a lot of upfront costs and i find it frankly just a little bit too much for a beginner entrepreneur i don't love the idea of you investing a ton upfront in a physical product with no proof that anyone wants it but let's say you get it up and running how hard is it actually to run i would actually put it as a beginner entrepreneur a five out of five and i know the e-commerce guys will go crazy over me for this but listen e-commerce is a thin margin business you're often operating at 20 30 percent margins and when you have margins that small, any little mistake in the business, whether it's you overhired, you got too much warehouse inventory, you spent too much on shipping and didn't understand how much it would actually cost, these things can really eat into your margin. And so you need to run the business so efficiently. And as a beginner entrepreneur, I just think it's a little too much to take on. And then finally, the likelihood to get you to your actual million dollar goal. Well, I would give it a two out of five, and here's why. If you look at e-commerce retail businesses and how much they actually make when they sell, you can see what's called a revenue multiple. How much are they doing in sales relative to how much are they worth? And unfortunately, the comps for e-commerce businesses are just not that good. Generally speaking, what you find is that you would need $1.5 million a year in sales to sell your business for a million dollars. So you have to build up a good bit of sales to even get to that $1 million mark. The second one, that one that you'll see online a lot, certainly Iman Ghazi has made it really popular, is starting a service business. Now, service businesses are super, super easy to set up. All you need is really a website and an email address and you can start selling a service. So on the how hard is it to get going, I would say it's kind of a one out of five. It's pretty easy to get a service business up and running, at least started. Now, how risky is it? Again, I would give service businesses a one out of five. They're just inherently not that risky. You're not building warehouse inventory. You're not really investing in a product. You're just going out of the world and saying, hey, I want to give you this service. Here's an hourly rate or here's a fixed fee. What do you think? So it's very easy to start and very low risk, but how easy is it to run? Well, this is where it gets a little more hard. I would say it's a four out of five. It's not quite the level of difficulty as say an e-commerce business, simply because an e-commerce business has so much more physical products and warehouses. Running a service business means running a team and it means running a quite large team because ultimately, Either you're selling your own time, which means you only have so many hours in the week, or you're selling other people's time. You have employees, you have contractors, and you're going out getting contracts saying, hey, we'll do your website, we'll do your YouTube videos, but 
behind the scenes, we have a team that's fulfilling those needs. And whenever your business scales solely by adding manpower, you it's a very hard business to scale. You just have to add more and more people to make more and more revenue. So it's not an inherently easy business to scale, not an inherently easy business to run. But where service businesses really fall flat is the actual likelihood to get you to your $1 million goal. I would unfortunately give it a one out of five. And this is because service businesses have a very low revenue multiple on exit. You know, just looking at market comps, we can see what do service businesses sell for today? And the range is roughly 40 to 80% of total revenue. So for simple math, let's just call it 50%. What that basically means is that you would need to get your service business to $2 million a year in revenue if you wanna sell that business for $1 million. And the logistical challenges to actually build a service business at $2 million a year are quite high because of this manpower scaling issue. So the third business model, and what I would consider is the actually best business model is what I call selling digital products. And this could be software, this could be a course, this could be a community, selling something that scales digitally. And specifically, the way that I'm gonna be evaluating it is a business that sells something digital that has a recurring revenue. Basically meaning that someone pays for something monthly, quarterly, or yearly, but it's not a one-time sale. This recurring revenue is really important. So first, how hard is it to get going? Well, it's a bit of a spectrum. I would split the difference and say it's a three out of five, but certainly selling enterprise SaaS software is harder to get going than selling a basic online course. But you know, even selling the software product, you can often pre-sell the product and say, hey, if we build this, would you buy it? Then you get paying customers that actually help fund and build the product, which also brings down the risk. So on the risk side, I would actually give it a two out of five. You're not building physical products. You're not building warehouses. You're just building something digital. And naturally, digital things are easier to build, are lower or cost to build, but there is some upfront cost sometimes. It depends on the way you build it. I think there's smart ways you can get around this by selling first, but we'll give it a two out of five. Now, effort to run really is, again, a spectrum because selling a course that has a digital membership is so much different than running a product, but I would say the range is maybe a two to a four. And the way that you're gonna find, you know, shifting one way or the other is the less hands-on you are with your customers, the lower the effort is. If you are selling a digital product, but you have a field team that goes in and checks in with a customer once a month and says, hey, how's it going, Bob? Do you like the product? Do you wanna keep paying us? That's a pretty high effort product. Unfortunately, it's a little bit like my product where we had a field team that would go into car dealerships basically every month and say, hey, how's it going? Anything that we can do to make it better. On the flip side, if you were like Squarespace and you just build a website template and people buy it and pay you monthly, pretty low cost, low effort business to run. So I would try to move away from the businesses that require this sort of in-person touch as you're going and really focus more on building a business where you sell something, they pay monthly, but you're not so hands-on running it day to day. But this is where it gets cool. The likelihood to get you to a million dollars. See, the revenue multiple for digital businesses are off the charts. And the reason for this is acquirers want to buy the best types of businesses. Naturally, they will pay more if a business is a better business model. And digital products are by far the best. So you end up with insane exit multiples, anywhere from five times revenue up to 50 times revenue. Now, let's just stick to 10x for the sake of this example, because it's a, sort of a tried and true number that you know works in most economic cycles. If you're running a 10x multiple, if you wanna make a million dollar business, all you need to do is get 83 people to pay you $100 a month for your service, and that business is worth a million dollars. So, you know, contrast that with a service business where you need $2 million a year in revenue, or an e-commerce business where you're selling $1.5 million, you only need like $100,000 a year in revenue for a software business to be worth a million dollars. So this is why I think, hands down, no question, building a software business is the smartest path to make a million dollars. That said, if you want to sort of tip your toes into entrepreneurship, what I'd recommend is actually start with a service business in the industry that you ultimately wanna build a software business in. Learn the ins and outs, learn the customer base, start selling them a service, and then as you build up your entrepreneurial chops and learn the ins and outs of actually building a business, move that business from a service business to a software business. I didn't do it that way. You know, my last business, I just went head in into car dealerships and started building software for them. I think that's probably the fastest path, but if you wanna make things maybe a little smoother, a little easier, you can start service and then switch into software. Now, once you have your business model, you need to make the most important decision of all, which is the market that you will be operating in. You see, you can have a great product, great service, but if it's in a market that sucks, 
doesn't matter how good you execute, you will not build a great business. So rather than trying to, you know, climb uphill and really work super hard, you wanna pick a market that's so ripe, so easy to produce a million dollar business in, that it's like it pulls you like a magnet. You can screw up, you can make all sorts of mistakes and you can still make your million dollars. So the way you do that, I have a very simple three-step framework. First, you wanna look at large markets. And by large market, I mean, what you wanna do is look at how much could you sell a product in this market for, whatever your idea is, times the number of customers in your market that could buy it. So here's an example from my own business. We could sell our software for about $30,000 a year. And there were 60,000 car dealerships in the US. So you take that $30,000 a year times 60,000, you get $1.8 billion. Your general rule of thumb is you wanna be at least a billion dollars, ideally two billion plus. The reason for this is you're looking for a massive market where even if you take 1% or 0.1% of it, you can still make well over a million dollars. The second thing you look for is a change or what I often call a wave of change and desire in the market. Again, using my own example, for the first time in history, actually saying, hey, I wanna buy cars online. And the numbers were like 48% of people wanna buy cars online. So you have this massive change where historically people always wanna go into the dealership, they wanna buy cars in person, but now they wanna buy cars online. It's a wave of change, but that wave is creating a gap, an unmet need, because while 48% of people want to buy cars online, 0% can. So we had a large market, with a wave of change, but a massive unmet gap being made. And this is what you wanna look for in any business you choose. If you have one of these, you can kind of build an okay business, but if you have all three, you can actually build, honestly, a pretty crappy business and still make a lot of money because you have a market that is so thirsty for what you're building. Now, once you have a business model and a market, it's time to do the fun part. It's time to get some customers. So you can't just sit back and rely it. There's no build it and they will come. That crap doesn't work in today's age. You need to actually actively go out, find customers and bring them to you. And if you wanna do it well, you need a systematic approach. You can't just be throwing darts at the wall, seeing what works and what doesn't work. This is where those cold outbound skills that I talked about earlier are really gonna come into play. So how you do it is a sort of three basic steps. First is you have some base assumptions about the product that you think people want to buy. You think they have this problem or they have this desire and your product fills that. But until you've actually sold that, those are just assumptions. So you need to actually go out and find those people test, is that assumption actually true? And so using cold outreach, what I would set a target of is 50 emails and 50 calls a day. You're gonna email and call these people and say, listen, I am working on this product. I think it can really change your life. I think it can do the following things for you. Would you be open to chatting about this? I wanna make sure that I'm doing this right. I'd love to get feedback and see if you're interested. And over this process, hopefully what you'll find is either A, People actually do want what you've built. They say, yeah, if you built that, I'd be really interested. Or you'll learn something just as valuable, which is they don't want what you built. They think your idea is not that important to them. It's not that helpful, or they're already using a solution that fills that gap. If that's the case, just go back and say, okay, well, what do you really want? Either way, by doing this volume approach, eventually you'll build a base of people that are interested in buying from you. But there's one more problem. They don't trust you. Sure, you may have cold called them, cold emailed them. You've built some rapport but because you're a new business, are they really sure that they can trust you with their needs, with their wants? And so this is where the easiest thing you can do is just offer a money back guarantee. Say, listen, if for whatever reason we do not fulfill our promises, you don't love the product, you don't love what we're doing, just let us know, we'll give you your money back. A money back guarantee is like the best beginner's entrepreneur hack because it removes all of the need for trust the need for certainty, the need to buy from a proven person and just say, no, if it's a money back guarantee, I can just go into this sort of on blind faith. And if it doesn't work out, I get my money back. So I highly, highly recommend add a money back guarantee in your early process as you're getting your first few customers. Now, two things you wanna keep in mind as you're going through this process. First is that failure is the most valuable teacher you can have. As you try things and as things fail, don't just say, we screwed up, say, what can we learn from our screw up? Because if you consistently fail, learn, try again with those new learnings, fail again, learn, eventually your failures will turn into successes. So in this early process, as you're getting your first few customers, be learning from your failures. Constantly keep a logbook, what's working, what's not working, and why. This will be your guiding principle on how you actually sort of iterate your way to finding what's called product market fit, which means you've built a product that the market actually wants. And at some point you may find that you've just missed the mark 
too far. Like not even we can just sort of tilt and turn our way towards it. You need to do a full 180. To give you a crazy example from your life, Slack, you know, the chat tool that we all have heard about, sold to Salesforce, I think for like 26, 20 billion dollars. But for the first couple of years, Slack was not Slack. It was actually a online gaming company. And they were building this online game that it turns out no one really liked. But what they found along the way is they had built this internal messaging tool for their own team and that thing was pretty cool. And they literally one day said, let's just shut down the gaming company and sell this chat tool that we've been using internally. We like it a lot. Maybe other people will like it too. If you are a dedicated, committed entrepreneur, you will find a way, but don't be afraid to say, we've been exploring just the wrong path entirely. We need to do a full 180 here and explore something new. I would base it on data, not just you feel low, you don't feel great, but there are times when you may need to pivot. Building Prodigy, we had a few hard pivots early on, and those really created the success that we ultimately had. Now, eventually you will start to see some success. You'll start to see some customers come in. You're gonna start to actually build a product, and that's when it's time to talk about scaling. You need to move beyond a one-man show if you wanna build a real business. Even the sort of like Dan Coes of the world that talk about, you know, build a one-man business, one-man business. They actually have a few employees. It's this sort of, you may be the key person in that business, but it's really hard to scale just a one person business. You need to start adding some people. And what you wanna do in this early phase is think about how can I make it so that every hour you do turns into 10 hours of work. And what I mean by that is you have a team that you can write the business plan for, they will go execute on these different things. You can come up with a new sales pitch, they'll go test it with 100 customers. So you start to build this principle where the work that you put in, every hour you put in, turns into 10 hours, 100 hours, 1,000 hours of work so that you can really scale your time. This is the only way that you can actually increase your output. Working more hours at some point just doesn't do it. And so as you think about scaling, I have a pretty proven framework that you should use. First, when you're hiring like the first one or two employees, you don't wanna hire specialists. Let's say you need sales. Don't go hire someone who's only gonna focus on sales. The reality is when you're getting started, you just don't know what you don't know. You don't know the gaps in your business plan. You don't know the gaps in your sales plan. And so your first hire should really be this guy or this gal who's just like, I'm gonna go in, figure this out. If it's not working, I will find a way to make it work. I will chew through brick walls to make this company successful because it matters to me personally. And then what you do with that first hire is you build a lot of documentation. You document what's working, what's not working and why, and slowly it becomes the way that you run the business. It's well documented. And then as you get the documentation, then you go and hire specialists. So you hire someone who's only gonna focus on cold calling prospects and they run this cold call process that you've documented and built with your first hire. Or when you go to hire an engineer, you have a development pipeline and a systematic way that you turn product ideas into product features. So you're building these early processes and then refining them and hiring specialists. And along this time, as you're starting to scale, it's time to start really seriously adding mentors into your circle. You know the saying, your network is your net worth. Well, if there's anything that I credit my success to, it's following this principle, trying to be surrounded by people that are more successful than me, farther ahead on the journey, so I can learn from their experience. But the reason I added this process and this step here versus in the earlier part of the video is it's this pushing car analogy. I think it's from Chris Rock. He basically says, you know, when you're broke and your car breaks down and you're on the side of the road, if you just stand outside the car and wave and say, hey, someone come help me, someone, you know, help me, I'm broke down, no one stops. But if you start pushing the car yourself, the people driving by all of a sudden start stopping. Why do they stop and want to help? Because they see you in the moment, in the action, and they wanna actually get out and join you and help you achieve your goal. People don't like to help people who just sit on the sideline. So by actually looking for mentors, now that you've started running the business and actually getting things going, you're way more likely to find the mentors of the caliber that you are looking for. And so what you wanna actually build is what I call a personal board of directors. This is basically a small set of people that you can go to and rely on for guidance, for feedback, and for just wisdom as you're building this business. I like three. I think three people is just like, the right number to get feedback from as you're building. And the way I go about building this is very systematic. First, I go to my network, I go to people that I already know that already like me and trust me and say, hey, I'm working on building a business. You know, here's where I'm at now, here's where I wanna be in five years. 
Do you know anyone that's done that successfully? Do you know anyone that comes to mind that is the best at building this type of business or going to this next level that I'm looking for? And you get some names from them and you say, great, you know, I did some research. Could you introduce me to one or two of these people? And all you do is you just meet these people and grab coffee with them. See if you hit it off. If you meet someone super successful, but you just don't gel, you don't hit it off and, and don't jive with them, it's probably not a good mentor relationship. You wanna have people that are successful, that you also like and wanna be around. Once you find those people and you've got coffee with them, the ask is very simple. You say, hey, listen, this was awesome. I learned so much. And if they say yes, then congrats, you've got your first mentor. And just do this with a few people. Again, I like three, but build a personal board of directors. And then now as your business starts scaling, the other thing that you wanna keep in mind is planning for the exit. And there's two things about this. First is how do you actually think about building a business that can exit? And then also, when is it time to exit? Here's how I'd think about both. To build a business that can exit, the main thing people are going to be looking for is a business that can operate without you running the damn thing every second of every day. If you have to respond to all the customer emails, to fix the bugs on the website, to go out and find customers, it's not really a business. You just have a pretty high paying job or maybe a low paying job if your business isn't doing so well. So that business is not super desirable because in order for someone to actually buy it, they kind of need you to be in the weeds running it. Once you sell the business, chances are you're not gonna wanna be there 24 seven. So they know this. And so the way you prepare your business for a sale is ultimately by building and documenting processes, starting to get other people to do the work so that you're more overseeing the results, you're checking in on the metrics, but you're not in the day-to-day -day running the business. Now, when to sell the business is a different strategy. When to sell the business is really a personal question, but I would caution you against thinking that you're gonna to wanna to run this business forever. Even if you like the business today, there may be a change in your personal circumstances or just a reason where you need cash, you need liquidity. And so I'd always be planning for an exit in the back of your mind. For me personally, the way I think about it is twofold. First, I had a certain goal. For me, it was $5 million. When I could sell the business for enough money where I would personally earn at least $5 million, then I would sell the business. I knew that that was my goal and I could retire off that money and live forever. So that was sort of my my first check mark. If I could sell the business, but it wouldn't make me my $5 million, it wasn't something that I was super interested in. I wanted to at least clear that hurdle. The second hurdle though, is more about a momentum and inflection point. See, if the business is growing super fast and I sell it, let's say this is my growth and I sell it here, I'm missing out on all this extra growth. And if I just waited maybe a year or two, I might have made two, three, five times more money. You have this risk of selling too early. Luckily, when you sell your business, acquirers know this. So what they're often doing is they're not paying for the business today, they're paying for what the business might look like one, two, three years out. And the way you wanna think about that is how much do you think the acquirer is prepaying for future years of growth? And this is basically the revenue multiple. The stronger the revenue multiple, the more they're paying for future years of growth. And then alongside that, how likely are you to actually hit that growth? If they are basically paying for three of the best years of growth in the history of your business, maybe not so likely that you'll actually achieve that. So it's a good time to sell if someone comes your way and offers that. But if they're paying for future growth, but they're projecting a very low growth rate on your business and you say, no, we're actually gonna grow much faster than that, then maybe it's worth holding off and saying, why don't we actually grow the business the way we think we can grow it and sell it in the future when we've demonstrated we can grow this business more. So to make this very simple, you know, early on we had an acquisition offer from Carvana. It was at a point where we were just at an inflection point. We were three people, but we really felt that we were onto something. And I might've made my $5 million, but I really felt like, you know what? I think we can grow the business much more than we're at today. And maybe in just a year or two, this might be worth so much more. So we actually said no to that offer and said, let's actually grow the business. Contrast that to when we actually sold the business for 110 million. It was at a point where I was like, the business, it's probably worth $110 million today, but maybe the next stage is like 200 or $500 million. And I think the likelihood of us getting there is significantly lower. And given that I'm gonna make more than $5 million in this transaction, and I don't think that there's a super high likelihood that we'll get to that $500 million billion dollar mark, it makes sense to sell now. So it's a very personal decision, but these are the two frameworks I'd think about. Now, there's four mistakes that you have to watch out for as you're going down this process. The first is putting all your eggs in one basket. And what I mean by this is don't go out and build seven income streams. That's not what I'm talking about here. It's putting all your eggs in one basket within one business. So for myself, I learned this the hard way when I was about 23, 24, I built this business up to $1,000 a day, but we had one customer acquisition channel. It was Google, organic search rankings. And long story short, 
Google changed the algorithm on us and we went from $1,000 a day to $0 a day overnight. So as you're building your business, whether it's you know relying on one key customer, one key source of customers, one key investor, you wanna to try to diversify the failure points of your business. Don't have one key employee, don't have one key failure of anything. That way your business is a little more resilient. Things go wrong in business. So constantly be evaluating your business and say, what can I diversify in here so that the business is not at risk for failure? This also gives you a higher exit multiple when you decide to sell the business. The second mistake is overconfidence, the Icarus effect. Overconfidence is something where you start to believe that you can do no wrong. And this happens a lot of times when you get caught up in the hype of your own business. Maybe you just raised a bunch of money. Maybe you're just winning deals left and right and you start to think that nothing can go wrong. There's a famous saying in business, only the paranoid survive. And, and I really adopted this mindset. Whenever we were doing well, I'd say, we need to be paranoid about this. What could go wrong? Constantly be enjoying the success, but also planning for where things could go wrong and trying to think ahead of those failures so that you're actually able to predict and forecast anything that could go wrong and have plans for it. By not being too overconfident, you actually drastically increase your chances of success. The third mistake is the lack of focus or the shiny object syndrome. You see, when you're building a business, it can be awfully tempting to try this new product, this new marketing tactic, this new plan, this new AI tool, you name it. What you often find is that these shiny objects give you a dopamine hit. You want to chase them, you want to try them out because it feels good, but it's usually not the thing that changes the business. There's usually not like one silver bullet that really takes you from zero to a million dollars. It's the fundamentals and putting in the reps and putting in the work that actually make things work. When you find that shiny object that is tempting you, what I would do is say, you know what? We're not going to think about that right now. Put it off for a week and say, let's focus on the fundamentals and work on these. And if in a week's time, the shiny object still feels like it can actually solve real problems in our business, then we can explore using it. But just right now, let's focus on the fundamentals. Don't go chasing shiny objects left and right. It can really cripple your chance of success. And the last is really the entrepreneur's Achilles heel, which is ignoring your health. It can be super tempting to sleep less, to eat like crap, to work constantly, but these things are correlated. You cannot neglect your body and your mind and the stability of that temple and still build a great business. You can do it in short sprints, but if you wanna have a sustained output and actually build something worthwhile and build a real business, you have to actually have a healthy body and a healthy mind. The same way you would schedule in a business meeting, the same way you would schedule in a sales call, schedule in time to take care of yourself. Eat healthy, get 30 minutes of exercise at least three times a week. Make this practical for yourself so that you don't neglect your health. And finally, to bring it all home, I just wanna give you three sort of bits of secret sauce that you can add to really take this to the next level. The first is what I call have a move the needle mentality. You see your greatest temptation when you're building your business will be to have too many priorities. And when you have too many priorities, what you actually have is no priority. So the way to actually fix this is you need to constantly refocus yourself. What I would do whenever I was running my business and I had you know a to-do list of 50 things, 100 things, I would write it all down. I wouldn't filter anything, write down everything I would think I could do, I could work on and look at my list and say, okay, Based on this list, what are the one to three things on this list that are really gonna move the needle? And that's all I'm gonna do. Once I achieve those three things, then I can work on the rest of my to-do list. But if I don't get there, no problem. I'm gonna focus on the one to three things that can move the needle and make a difference in my business today. And by constantly focusing on the things that actually move the needle, you will find that the 50 things on your to-do list probably actually don't need to get done. You can let plates drop, you can drop the ball on things because you're focusing on what moves the needle. The second sort of secret sauce is emotional intelligence. You see, all business at the end of the day is people business. Whether you're selling your product or hiring someone, you're just doing a deal based and filled with emotions between two people. And once you really understand this, you can stop trying to sell, sell, sell your product or sell yourself. And you really just sit down and say, hey, we're two people, let's let go of the pretense here and just hang out. Let's talk about what you're looking to get out of life, what I'm looking to achieve and see if those things meet in the middle. Develop your emotional intelligence along this journey because it just makes everything so much easier. The sort of you know, stereotype of the Asperger's entrepreneur that you know, doesn't communicate with people, slams doors and just locks himself in a closet, that 
kind of works, but only in Silicon Valley bubbles. It's not the way you build a real business. At some point, you have to interact with people, get them on your side, and so build your emotional intelligence. And the final secret sauce is have a pay it forward mindset. There will be times in your business when you are just struggling. You don't deserve a lucky break and yet you get one. Someone takes a chance on you, takes a chance on your product, buys something, is unhappy, but doesn't ask for their money back. These things happen. I don't know how to explain it. I you know, call it karma, call it what you will, but there's, I truly believe, a fundamental law of the universe where if you are generous and kind to others, that kindness and that generosity comes back to you. So in your journey, Take time to be generous to people. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Be kind when they can do nothing for you. It's a selfless act, but you could almost think of it as selfish because I am telling you the fundamental laws of the universe mean that this kindness, this generosity will come back to you. And trust me, there's gonna be times when you need it. Now, if you wanna learn more about how to actually build a business and change your life, I also just filmed a video on 13 lessons from building a $110 million business myself in my 20s. I'm gonna put the link over here. So just click that and I'll see you there.